All right, one, two, one, two. You know how we do with your boy BQ. It's the lounge. It is the place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. I don't typically do Impact reviews on the pay-per-view weekends, Impact Plus weekends, because I feel like by the time I get to it, the event has already happened, and why why bother, right? But I did want to talk about this episode because I thought it was good, and there were some important things that kind of went down that I think deserve a little bit of spotlight. I am going to be reviewing Under Siege. I'll be doing that tomorrow. Under Siege was really good, folks. Like That was probably their best Impact Plus show that I can remember. That was a really, really excellent show. So definitely want to you know, give that its love. Um, but I'm going to review this episode already knowing what the Under Siege results are. So, you know, obviously I'll be able to tie him into um, some of the storyline stuff. Uh, now, before kind of get into the episode, obviously, if it's your first time here, hit that subscribe button. But first, I got to talk. I, I got to kind of talk about this because I've been talking about it on Twitter a little bit. There were some things that happened this episode, namely Dirty Dango, uh, you know, Courtney Rush. There's a couple things that happened where we got some kind of interesting payoffs. And, uh, you, you know, obviously I'm going to get to it. I was a really big fan of the Dango stuff. And the majority of the people I see online are a fan of it. There's some who don't really care for it, but... Uh, me in particular, I really liked it. And I did say last week, even though I hated with passion the whole chest hair thing. And I'll, I'll talk about that again in a little bit when just when I get to the, the dango stuff. Um, even though I hated that, I did say the, the saving grace to that was that dango was acting kind of serious. So maybe this was turning into something. And it did go that direction. So I get the, maybe backlash is a strong word, but for sake of argument, I'm going to say backlash. I get the backlash on Twitter where people are like, see, you know, let things play out. Uh, you, you know, you, you, I get, you know, you were wrong. You, you, I bet you take it back now, huh? Those kind of comments, okay? I am someone who can admit when they're wrong. But here's what I want to say about this, okay? Yes, we're getting good payoffs. I'm into the Dango thing. I'm into the Courtney Rush thing. And when we talk about Under Siege tomorrow, you know, I'm happy that Jay Chris was the, was the mystery partner. But here's the thing with the whole... Because I, I get let it, let it play out a lot. I get that a lot on Twitter when I have my you know, opinions on things. Getting a good ending, a good payoff is not an excuse for horrible television leading up to that point. The death dolls, including when Ty was still there, the coven, the segments they were doing were some of the worst television backstage segments that impact has done if not the worst in 2023 okay dango even though i thought his role in the santino thing was funny i i did get genuine laughs out of this i was entertained but it wasn't necessarily good um i didn't think that storyline was horrible necessarily what i thought was horrible was that was the ending where they rip off the shirt and there's a patch of chest hair missing. Um, Santino got attacked four weeks prior to that. So number one, you're going to say, okay, the hair didn't grow back in that amount of time. I shave my chest, folks. I have to shave almost daily. I'm not saying it grows back to its full length, but I mean, it, it, it grows pretty quickly. Number two, wouldn't it make sense for him to just shave his chest since he typically does anyway? You know, he had the match on under siege. He came out fully, fully shaven. He wasn't like had a patch of hair missing. You know, and it's also not realistic. I'm sure he did have chest hair for the angle, but it, it's still not realistic that you can reach back and, and, and rip a chunk off. You know what I mean? 
so so that was just like so beyond bad so even though i like the dangle stuff it's not worth i mean it's not i'm saying it's not worth it's not an excuse for the payoff to be good but to give you like weeks and weeks of bad television the same with sammy callahan like people were really happy jay christ came aboard but the majority of fans have hated the design and sammy callahan stuff you know i I'm, i'm sure there's people who do like it i haven't seen it personally I haven't seen anyone like, oh, this is some good shit. But it's the same thing I just said. It's just not worth you you have all this horrible television leading up to it. What if you're someone who doesn't really watch that much impact? For those of us who who tune in every week, okay, cool. We're not going anywhere. But if you, so that's why, you know, we like long term stories, but the story has to be good because you're also trying to, to reel in new viewers and some, you know, or lapsed viewers and people who are tuning in. I can, I can promise you, it doesn't matter how high or low impacts viewership is every single episode. There is someone watching who hasn't seen it in a long time or is tuning in for the first time. I can assure you that happens every single week. So you have to hook those people. They may not stick around for the long-term story, you know? So You know, if you're an author and you write a book and the ending is fucking phenomenal, it's not an excuse for the rest of the book to suck leading up to it or the middle of it. That's where it seems to happen. It's kind of like the birth of the storylines, decent in most cases, and it's the middle. It's the body of the work that is bad. And then the ending, the ending is good. You know, I'll even say that with the uh, Macklin and PCO thing. I'm like, why the fuck is he wrestling PCO? I, I was pretty sure PCO was going to be his first challenger. But um, a lot of the stuff in the middle, it wasn't bad. But I didn't think it was establishing Macklin as like a dominant champion. But then we watch it play out on the pay-per-view. And it, dude, Under Siege had a phenomenal ending. Put Scott through the table again. I watched that like 50 times. Um, but but there was still some bad stuff leading up to that, you know. If you think of the Bully Ray storyline with Josh Alexander, that was pretty good, the whole thing. You know, it was the beginning where people were like, why is Bully Ray wrestling for the title? But the story was good, and then the, the ending was good. So that's what that's what I, I would like to see, more consistency in that area. So I went off on that for a little bit, but I really want to get that that point out that a good payoff and a good ending – is not an excuse for giving us bad television in, in the interim. Uh, Cause some people may not stick around for that ending, you know? All right. So uh, I'm going to run through this. I, I, you know, I damn, I really wanted to watch BTI cause Shogun was on there um, and I didn't, but Sammy Callahan obviously won. The show kicks off Mike Bailey versus Chris Saban. I've said this in the past. I'm not a huge fan of either of these guys. Doesn't mean I dislike them. Doesn't mean I want them to leave Impact. They're just not my favorite wrestlers in the company. Um, so, but this was a really good match. A lot of people did enjoy it. For me, it was entirely too long. It's good to see uh, Chris Saban get the win, you know. But there were some instances where the match looked like it should have been over, and and Mike Bailey would kick out. I'm like, this match will not end. So for me, it was a little long because I think the powers that be at Impact always want Mike Bailey to be strong. But I mean, he wasn't even wrestling on the fucking Under Siege card. So I just thought Chris Saban's victory should have been a little more decisive at the end. Like it just seemed like he was really struggling to keep Mike Bailey down. And it's good that he gets that momentum going into Under Siege. And I'm I'm big on winning before a pay-per-view. But you also kind of got to win decisively or in a decent amount of time. Like, you cannot wrestle someone for 20 minutes and barely beat them. And then we think they're, you know, and then we're supposed to believe they're going to win the title. So that's kind of my, you know, whatever on it. The majority of you probably enjoy this match more than I do because it's just not my style of wrestling. But uh, but it was pretty good, and it was a good way to to open the show. I just would have liked to see Chris Bailey. I mean, Chris Bailey, 
Chris Saban win a little more decisively, win quicker, and then really get that just, you know, the rub before the pay-per-view. But, you know, they wanted to keep Bailey strong, which I thought was kind of unnecessary. Um, then they show some of the Steve Macklin and, and PCO stuff. So I'm not going to get too much into the backstage stuff just because, you know, we're just going to run through this episode because tomorrow I'm going to actually talk about Under Siege. But Steve Macklin was saying he has a replacement for PCO because they said we killed PCO. We took him out. So I'm going to announce the replacement at the end of this. Kenny King and Sheldon Jean took on Decay. I enjoyed this quite a bit. This is just more my style of wrestling. Like I like dudes who look like Kenny King and built like him and, and Sheldon Jean. And, um, you know, for the most part, I do enjoy Decay's work. I'm not a big fan of like the biting the face off thing. But aside from that, uh, it was cool. And I just uh, I enjoyed this. Nick Aldis was on commentary and, and Nick Aldis. You're going to hear me say this a lot. He knows how to sell a match. He knows how to sell a feud. And this is, you know, a very low card match on Under Siege. It was, you know, third match or something like that. Uh, but but both of these guys really sold it as something I really wanted to see. So Nick Aldis, he, he's a really good addition to the company. And I've mentioned before that there's no doubt in my mind that Impact didn't want him to wrestle for the championship here. <laughs> uh, even though Slammiversary is the bigger match, but I... I I wouldn't I shouldn't say they wanted him to, but I, I bet the discussion happened. But he knows he doesn't do business like that. He doesn't do business the way Impact tends to do with their title shots. So but this was really good. Um and I thought Kenny King looked looks excellent here too. And him, him and, and Sheldon Jean are a great pairing. I hope that they do some uh, I'm sorry, I, I got it confused with under siege. He Kenny King lost it under siege. Uh, I forgot I was not talking about Under Siege for a second. I'm talking about this actual tag team match. Uh, but they did beat Decay. And um, I just thought, I think they had, there's a lot of potential for them as a tag team going forward. So even though he did lose the the match with Nick Aldis, I hope them as a, uh, a team um, can do something. Because Kenny loses a lot. And I, I, I'm i very impressed with him and where he's come this, thus far and this point in his career. So I hope that they... Uh, continue to do a lot but just you know candy king on the mic after and uh nick aldis on the mic you know just these guys really knew how to to sell this so i was um very pleased with it very pleased uh, as a fan just watching it and then um you know they show rosemary with the hourglass um rosemary's been gone for like three weeks how slow is this hour hourglass um but yeah, that's that. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. Taylor Wilde took on Jessica. So what happens with the Coven is they trade wins and losses. Ever since they've been formed, they lose one week. It's typically Kylan King wrestling singles. And then they win the next week, whether it's a tag team match or it's Taylor Wilde winning. Taylor Wilde's... You, Seems to win more often than not. It's like Kylan King who doesn't beat anybody. Which kind of sucks for me because I really think she's going to be that gal in the knockouts division like sooner than later. I, I, I think so high of her. Uh, but she, she, you know, she's like 6'1". I mean, she she's she's a tall girl and she's losing these matches. But um, Taylor Wilde wrestled Jessica. This is basically a fucking squash. Uh, because they wanted to do the post-match angle. And it shows backstage and it shows the feet and it's Courtney Rush. So Rosemary is now Courtney Rush. I'm going to I'm gonna give you some positives here in a second. But on the negative side, even though there was like a kind of a pop for the Courtney Rush, the crowd did not give a shit. She went for the sharpshooter, looked for a crowd reaction, pin drop. You know? Um, I don't think the people knew what to make of it. And, and so this is something I, you know, I like to talk about and it's the disconnect between the fans in the arena and the creative and the storyline and what's going on. The fans. Okay. No clue that Rosemary is in the undead realm and that there's, uh, the hourglass of time and 
No clue. None. And Rosemary just randomly appears one day and she's fucking Courtney Rush, dude. You know? And it's like, how are they supposed to respond to this? Because they don't they don't know what they're looking at. And that's what happened here. I said the same thing last week when Jay Vidal came out and uh, confronted Trinity and said, Giselle Shaw says, says yes. Like, they don't know what the fuck is going on. You know? It's it's the um the issues you have with with tape television sometimes or all the time. But um, you know, that's a issue they're gonna have if they try to combine the two. Like if you build start building a story in the ring, then let it play out in the ring. If you're building the story in the backstage, let it play out backstage. But when you start combining the two to where the live audience has no clue what's going on, you're gonna get those reactions. I mean, dead. They did not give a shit. Positive side. I'm looking forward to this. I was saying, why did why does the undead realm matter? Tell me they're not trying to find Taya. They're not. They were just, you know, this was an ex, you know, not an excuse, but this was a reason to bring back Courtney Rush. So, when, so we're thinking, okay, they're going to havoc. But no, they're they're gonna do this formation of the death doll. So this is like the third version of rosemary and havoc the positive i really want to say about this impact does a very good job with recognizing when someone is stale and these like certain characters i'm talking about the rosemary's the havocs sue young abyss you know like a kind of extreme characters they they recognize when someone is stale and they give us something different because you can't tell me Sue Young would appear on WWE television and she wouldn't be stale within three months. You know, they tried to bring the broken Matt Hardy over there. Like, that didn't work. Um, a smaller company, I think it's easier for a smaller company to work with those kind of gimmicks. But they do a pretty good job of realizing, okay, this is this is stale. We got to do something with it. Rosemary, for me, was beyond stale. Um, now there's some people, Sammy Callahan, Eddie Edwards, like they're very slow to, uh, to freshen them up. So are they, you know, are they perfect at this? No, but for the most part, they do a pretty good job. They don't freshen up, you know, the presentation and all that shit. It's the same graphics, the same music, the same camera angle, everything's the same, right? So in that sense, they don't really freshen up the product, but when you're taking characters, they, they get a lot more mileage out of them than I think another company would. Like AEW has Abaddon, and they they can barely even put her on TV because they don't know what to do with that gimmick. Impact could could do something with it. Like it would it would get mileage. So um, that is something that they have some experience with because they did the uh, Abyss and Joseph Park. They did Sue Young and Susie. Um. And then Susan, she was Susan at one point. You know, they they're pretty good with this kind of alter ego stuff. And you, we can debate if it's good or bad, but it's different. It's fresh, so I'm down for that. I'm I'm always down for something that's you know different and fresh. Always, you're you know nine times out of ten, I'm going to be down for it unless it looks really really bad. But the uh, the crowd just didn't care. They didn't understand why Courtney Rush was there. You know, that that's a that's a big problem. Angels took on Rich Swan. I love this. This is, you know, two of my favorite guys. And they just put on a really, really good match. And um, Rich Swan gets the win here. And obviously we talk we love I love, but you know, people do on Twitter too. They like to talk about the lighting. I do think they have to like the so I'm not trying to bring race into this, but I'm trying to do what I would do from experience. I would, I would take a rich Swan match and a Trinity match when I'm doing post editing. And I would be like, I need to sharpen the the resolution, change the, 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 um, saturation and the lighting and the balance and the colors, the hues, whatever it is, whatever settings you mess with. You use Rich Swan and Trinity as your, uh, you you know, you take a clip of their work, loop it over and over, 
and edit that and do your editing and your color corrections, whatever it is, with those people in the ring. Because because they are dark skinned, they are in there, you know. I'm sure you guys have noticed, like with, with, with both of Trinity and Swan, they're wrestling and you can't really see them. You see clothes running around, flying around the ring. So that's why you take people like that where you're like, okay, these are the ones who are more difficult for us to watch. We're going to edit those segments and whatever those settings are, we we can use them for the rest of the show because we know they're going to be able to see havoc and um, anyone with lighter skin. We're, you know, but if you change it so we can see the dark people as well, then you, then you got something, you know, but I really enjoyed this. And then Rich Swan got the, Gets the momentum going into the match. I expected Angels to win because, you know, I'm just like, I'm pretty sure Sammy and his partners are going to win it under siege. So are we going to have the design lose twice in a row? You know? But yeah, this was great. Uh, Rich Swan hits a Phoenix Splash. And it was very funny seeing Sammy Callahan come out with, uh, you know, Rich Swan's music. I, th- I thought that was kind of funny. Uh... And the design, and you know, they attack him after the match, post post match shit. And then we get, you know, backstage, G is talking to Jordan or to Diana. I'm sorry. Alicia comes in just like she did last week, yelling. And, you know, I think she's doing a good job as a heel, but it's a little over the top. I mean, you come in. I always like I always tell my daughter's a really loud speaker and I always have to be like shh match the energy of those around you. That's the volume that you should be speaking with. You know, so you have this interview and then she just comes in, all right, yeah, Diana, yeah, Jordan. You know, it's a it's just a little loud for my taste, and I think that's where some people are like kind of turned off by it. But um, you know, I love Alicia, so it's all it's all gravity on my end. And then they showed um, Killer Kelly and Masha brawling through the stage, and I mean through the arena. And uh, well, they were backstage, under siege. They were brawling through the arena, so they're they're building a lot of heat between these two, which I think is a good thing. Like this is a this is a feud where you don't want them to just wrestle with no build, and you don't really want them to talk either. So if this is what you want to do, that's fine. I worry that it's leading to hardcore match, no DQ, you know. Um, it's most likely leading to an, a, a, either a false count anywhere or a last knockout standing match. I'm fairly certain it's it's going that direction, but I don't um, have a lot of interest in any hardcore, no DQ, no rules type of shit. I never do. Um, I, I hope they're not. I hope it's not just like oh, it's a monster's ball or something like that. Like no, you know, uh, false count anywhere. I can dig that. Um, Last knockout standing is usually usually pretty decent. Alicia Ass Pants takes on Jordan Grace, and they are calling her Alicia Edwards now. She's not just Alicia. They're adding her last name to it, which I think is a good thing. And she wrestles Jordan Grace. This match does not last long, as it as it probably shouldn't. But uh, she took all of that Grace Driver. Let me tell you that that looked extremely painful. She's probably a lot lighter than what Jordan's used to use used to picking up. So pretty devastating. There were some quick matches on this show, you know, just uh, Taylor Wilde and, and uh, Jessica and then Jordan Grace and, and Alicia Edwards. So we, we got we got a couple quicker ones. Maybe it was because Shay, uh, Chris Sabin and uh, Speedball Mike Bailey would not end. I don't know. Then we get the Dirty Dango promo. And I talked about this at the top of the show. And, you know, the payoff was good. I am interested in this. I am locked in. I am all about some Dango. I would have changed his name. I don't think he should have remained Dirty Dango. And I would have put the Digital Media Championship on him. But, you know, he's saying things, you know, he's calling the digital media championship a toy belt, which it is. It means nothing. Um, You know, saying that we're living in the gratitude era. This whole thing was a little long, though. He he really spoke for like three and a half minutes. Like it was a little long, but the content was very good. 
and it's one less comedy act on the show, so I, I'm down with that. And I'm okay with comedy on a show, but bad comedy I'm not okay with, and that's what they're right now. They're starting to revisit and put a lot of it on the show. So I'm really, really interested to see where this goes. But I would still change his character up a little bit because, you know, he's saying, I don't need this job. I have money. Like, you can really, you know, give him a normal name, throw him in a fucking suit, you know, just just change it all up. But I, I really, really am looking forward to what Dangle's going to do on TV. I'm like, did he just become my favorite wrestler? And maybe he said some things that some other people have said in the past, you know. But coming from a guy like this, from the mid card, uh, I'm just I'm I'm really excited about this. I'm I'm no shit. I just I ate this up, and I want to see like what's the next step for him. He's gonna feud with Joe Hendry for a little while. This is um, you know Joe Hendry has had some kind of goofy feuds and this kind of forces him to be a little a little more serious so i'm just man m- props 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 for this but again that doesn't mean give us a month of bad television to get to this point because you you may turn people off along the way east austin took on john schuyler so last year last week we had chris bay versus jason hotch um, I'm sorry, other way around. Chris Bay took on John Schuyler. Last week, we had Ace Austin versus Jason Hotch. That was a pretty solid match. I enjoyed it. And this one, you know, they're trying to... I didn't, I knew Schuyler wasn't going to beat Chris Bay. I mean, come on. Um, you know, Hotch is kind of the worker out of the group, and Schuyler's a talker. But I'm, I'm... I like what they're doing with the good hands because they're kind of becoming the learning tree. And I thought the learning tree was one of the more entertaining parts about impact when that was happening and they pulled the plug on it very quickly for some reason. And I don't know why, but I thought it was really, really good. I thought like there was a, I I thought it had a lot of mileage. I thought, I thought it had legs. I thought it could go for quite some time. It kind of appears he's not involved with moose anymore. I'm talking about Brian Myers, but clearly they're trying to get the good hands um, a little bit of momentum so they can win the titles eventually. I mean, wrestle for the titles, not win them. I don't think they're going to win. But uh, this was this was pretty good. And Chris Bay obviously gets the win. It's, it's 50-50 bucking. And I explained last week when I say 50-50, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're wrestling the same person every week. It's not like, oh, Dolph Ziggler versus Sheamus for eight weeks in a row and they just trade wins. But I mean, it's... These guys wrestled each other's partners last week. Like now Bullet Club has a win. Now Good Hands have a win. You know, they, they do that. They do that throughout the show, which which halts momentum, you know, but but this was this was pretty solid. But this overall, this episode just it didn't seem like we were spinning our wheels, you know, like we got some, you know, a couple angles that got you excited for under siege. A couple that just let us know, hey, we're uh, these stale characters are getting a change, are getting a makeover. You know, there was just some, there was just some good things. It was extremely solid from top to bottom. I didn't think anything was was bad, and there was a couple episodes where I said they were really bad, but in the same breath, I said, well, maybe this is the formula. You know, we just came out of a pay per view. Maybe it's, um. We have we have all the jobbers on the show. We just we just kind of having matches and start little by little building from there. Like maybe that's just the formula. But but in the interim, we had people wrestling on the show that don't really re- usually wrestle on the show very much. And just the birth of a couple angles that looked like they were going to be really bad, they were okay. Um. I think that was it for the, the wrestling, right? Then Steve Macklin went to the went went to the ring, and I was really, really entertained with this. I thought this episode helped Macklin come look came come off like a little bit bigger of a star and come off like your champion. Where the previous episodes, I didn't think he was. I didn't think he was coming off like that. I thought with this episode that he did, 
And he comes out first and says that, you know, PCO's dead. We killed him. And I'm going to name my own number one contender. It is Champagne Singh. I knew that's who it was going to be, but it's Champagne Singh. His music, his fire music hits. I didn't really like him as Raj Singh. I didn't like him with the Desi Hit Squad. It's it's taken me a while to come around on him. And at first I was like the Champagne Singh thing is a little goofy. We're supposed to believe he's rich. And then they, you know, they line him with Macklin. I'm like, ah, it doesn't really fit for me. But he comes out. And the minute he opens his mouth, I am all in on this guy. This was an incredible promo. Little Chris Jericho-esque with the list. But it was, he spoke well. He's funny. I didn't know he was Jinder Mahal's cousin. But he spoke well. He was funny. He came off like a bigger deal than he is. Like I was listening to him and I, I was like, dude, I can see him not in the main event, but I can see him flirting with that. I can see him getting close to that. I don't think he's going to headline a pay-per-view, but I think when he, he just did this promo and you know, he's obviously been with Macklin. He exited the BTI uh, category for me. Like he, he was like the dude you put on BTI. And I think just based off this alone, you don't need to be on BTI anymore. He has showed that he can, um, you know, it took him a while to find what they wanted to do with these guys, but this really works for me. I think they're going to break him off from Macklin a little bit at this point. I, you know, I think it was done for the angles, but he comes out there <clears throat> and he has the list of people he wants to thank. And, you know, he's like, you don't boo. Oh, man, the crowd is booing him. He's like, you don't boo a number one contender like this guy. Nailed it. And then Scott Dio Moore's music hit. Scott the headset. And he killed it. The minute he came out with, okay, you guys. Hey, no, hey. The, the minute he opened his fucking mouth, I was like, oh my God. Like, he really killed the segment. I'm not saying he was unnecessary because we know in the grand scheme of this feud and what we saw it under siege, like he was necessary for this, but I'm just saying he's just not a, a warm on air personality to me. Um, I think he has to come off more like he's speaking naturally to, to a guy like Steve Macklin because he, cause he comes off like he's cutting a promo, you know, he's walking around, he's staring at the ground and, talking to the people and just look like he's getting ready to hype up a match or something. And it's just not, doesn't come off extremely natural to me, but he, just because he was on screen, he just killed it. The minute this fool started talking, I was like, here we go. And, um, you know, he lets him know that, uh, he is going to wrestle PCO and that, that PCO is, is, is alive. And Macklin said, you're going to put the title belt on me. You were supposed to do it last time. You're going to do it this time. So they're taking the angle here of Macklin versus the authority. You know, um, if that's where they want to go with it, that's fine. If it makes Josh Alexander more of a hero when he does come back from injury, that's fine. But, um, but I did think Scott killed it when he came out and then, you know, and then PCO of course shows up and, as I said last week, I thought Macklin should have spent the last couple of weeks beating up PCO hard. I don't think PCO should even look like he had a chance. I know that's like counterproductive how how I normally talk. Um, but I think in this case, when you're trying to build up your world champion, I, th I just think he should just be strong every week, and then the and then under siege comes and and he wins. He's booked strong leading up and he wins. You know, I, I just think that's, that does more to build your heel champion as a star rather than constantly showing him running from PCO. You feel me on that? So I'm going to talk under siege tomorrow, guys. I, I just, I thought this was a good episode. I thought it deserved to be um, talked about. As I said last week, if it's good, I'm going to say it's good. So with everything, um, 
you know, negative that I say when I say I don't like something, I hope you're really listening to me and realizing I'm not saying it for the sake of being negative. I have what I think are legitimate reasons. I usually try to explain my reasons. I'm not just like, ah, this episode sucked. Next. I'm going to tell you why I didn't like something. And I'm always going to tell you what I would have liked to have seen to make it a little bit better. But the last three episodes, really good job. Under Siege was great. And against all odds is in two weeks. So they, they have no time to waste. We have to have two good weeks of good, strong television. And they have a real opportunity now because some people came out of Under Siege with some with some heat. Some people came out with some really good momentum. There were some storylines out of Under Siege that people are genuinely saying what's next you know so they've they've got a, a good opportunity here to not put bad comedy on tv bad angles and bad segments and no dq matches and all that shit like don't go back to those bad habits don't put scott on tv he just got burned i can see him showing up the next freaking week like, don't put them on TV. Um, they're good. At, you know, we'll talk about Under Siege, but there's some really interesting stuff happening with Bully Ray and Steve Macklin that I'm I'm really looking forward to. So props to Impact Wrestling because this was just a good show. It was a great go-home show for Under Siege. They don't, they don't typically do strong go-home shows, in my opinion. I've, I've never really, I've never really thought that was like their strong point. You know, the the shows themselves, the pay-per-views and all that, those are always pretty damn good. But it's um, these go-home shows that I always think are really lost. They just seem lost. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know where they're going with it. They don't know who should be wrestling. They don't know who should be winning, who should be losing. Like, it's always it's always a mess for me, but they did a really good job with this. So thanks for uh, tuning in, guys. Uh, we'll be talking under siege here very, very soon. I'm your boy, BQ. I'm out. Peace. <laughs>